Minister, you are welcome, but I am sorry to say that while there are features of this bill that are unobjectionable and indeed very desirable, this is the legislation that I believe will destroy your legacy. You were the minister who piloted the children's referendum through the Oireachtas and to a majority vote on the referendum, although the validity of that referendum is currently under court scrutiny. However, you brought that referendum forward as a measure designed to secure constitutional protection for children's best interests. Unfortunately, this legislation wrecks your credentials and this government's credentials as defenders of the best interests of children. This legislation contemplates and facilitates a very fundamental attack on a child's rights by allowing some children to be deprived of the right to be brought up by their own mother and father or in any event by a mother and father. Minister, Joe Kennedy, the father of President John F. Kennedy, was a successful investor who made a fortune in the 1920s. He avoided the crash of 1929 by withdrawing his investments before the market collapsed. The story goes that Kennedy said that when he heard the shoeshine boy at the subway telling him about his own investment strategy, he knew the market was at risk. He could spot groupthink and he knew the damage it could cause. Well, we suffered disastrous policies in this country when the main political parties supported a system of groupthink and economic dogma based on popular misconceptions around property and banking. We went for years with very little in the way of meaningful challenge through the prevailing popular consensus. We need, need only look around our towns, villages and unfinished housing estates to see where the fashionable, uh, popular, the fashionable popular consensus led us. Important questions merit detailed and careful consideration, Minister. We should be guided by values and by sober reflection when faced with making major changes in our society. Where would we be now if the bank guarantee had been debated and considered instead of being rushed through? Now, if this is true of economic policy, how much more is it true of the welfare of children? With this legislation, history is repeating in the social sphere the tragedy of the groupthink that saw the Celtic tiger boom and then bust. Tendentious debate within the media and the sameness in the viewpoint of the political parties around this legislation are the opposite of what the public is entitled to expect from the journalistic and legislative class. It's remarkable and tragic that this bill saw no substantial changes in the doll. It's farcical that we are running this bill through the Shannon like an express train in one week sitting alongside the marriage referendum legislation which the hasty and under scrutinised passage of this bill is designed to facilitate. Let's recall, Minister, that the Animal Health and Welfare Act has 78 sections and took 13 months before enactment as every line was poured over, searching for problems and unforeseen consequences. This bill has over 172 sections and the government wants to enact it within weeks. Obviously, the Oireachtas and the government believe that the animal welfare issue deserves more careful consideration than children's welfare. As much as I decry the lack of scrutiny of this legislation in the Dáil and in the media, I'm even more surprised by the behaviour of those bodies and individuals who claim to represent the interests of children and who, and perhaps this is the problem, often receive taxpayers' money to represent the interests of children. I read carefully the report of the Ombudsman for Children and the consultation paper of the Children's Rights Alliance regarding this legislation. Nowhere in either document was it affirmed that a child had a right to be raised by his or her natural mother and father where possible. No reference to the explicit provisions of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child where a child has a right to parents in his or her life save for a reason pertaining to that child's welfare. The UN Treaty references to parents do mean mother and father minister and this is no more than what most people all over the world have believed since the dawn of civilization that children are best brought up by their biological parents. I've heard Geoffrey Shannon, the Special Rapporteur on Child Protection, acknowledge more than once that, and I quote, two biological parents in a low-conflict marriage provide the gold standard environment for the upbringing of children. But nowhere does your legislation, Minister, acknowledge, reflect or attempt to promote this, and that is shameful. So I'm sorry to say that the children's rights lobby, by supporting this legislation where they do, have undermined, as you have done, Minister, any claim eh, to champion the interests of children or to be championing the interests of children. How can I say otherwise when they and you support a bill that fails to recognise that children have a right to be loved and cared for by the man and woman who conceived them, their mothers and fathers, who each have given them one half of their genetic and family history? This legislation drives a coach and four through certain children's rights to their own mothers and fathers. This bill states that an egg or sperm donor, quote, is not the parent of a child born as a result of that procedure and has no parental rights and duties in respect of the child. Whether that donor has earned the right to be a parent is a separate issue. This legislation should not facilitate the donation business, and I will return to that at committee stage. 
In summary, where is the protest from the supposed children's rights defenders at the idea that the man or woman who gives you half your identity can be legally denied to be your parent simply because the state and the adults involved will it to be so? There is still an opportunity to place children's rights, as opposed to the desires of adults, Minister, at the centre of this legislation. But I have no confidence that you have any willingness to do it. But I will table a series of reasoned amendments which seek to place children's interests and rights back at the centre of this legislation. Failure to ban egg and sperm donation in this children and family relationships bill is a big mistake. Also a mistake is the failure to allow children born of assisted human reproduction to know their genetic parents until they are adults. And to think in the first draft of this legislation it wasn't proposed to allow any right to know uh, their, uh, who their genetic parents were. That will show how far removed from children's welfare and best interests the class of people who have devised this legislation actually were until a hasty amendment later in the day to at least give the child the dignity of finding out if they look for it when they're 18 who their genetic parents are. And people say, that this is a children's friendly piece of legislation. What rot, I'm afraid to say. To reiterate, the singular failure of this legislation is that it removes, as a matter of policy, any preference for a child's genetic mother and father to be in his or her life, and that is unfair and it is unjust. The real test for people, both in this House and in the government, who claim to support children's rights, will be whether they have the courage to support amendments which seek to protect a child's right to his or her genetic mother and father. We've arrived at an unhappy juncture in Ireland when the Commission on Assisted Human Reproduction can rhetorically pose the question, should science do everything that science can do without other consideration? And the answer seems to be a resounding yes, because it seems to be all about what people, what adults actually want. We're now technologically proficient in creating life through artificial means, yet the people in power are either hopelessly naive or morally bankrupt. Commentators proclaim that all a child needs is love, without reference to family, kinship, blood ties, history, or any of those things which give us identity and a sense of place in the world, and indeed which give us love. If this bill becomes law in its current form, the means of science will now be employed only to serve the ends identified by adults and fertility professionals involved, separate from all consideration of children's welfare, or indeed justice towards the child. Yes, it was the, and I'm concluding shortly, uh, yes, it was the Minister for Health, Leo Varadkar, who said in 2010, every child has the right to a mother and father, and as much as possible, the state should vindicate that right. How unfortunate, and how unexplained, by the way, that he should have moved away from his previously expressed views about the prior rights of children. This bill shows the state not only denying the right of certain children to their fathers and mothers, but in particular separating such children from their genetic mothers and fathers or from both genetic parents during their formative years. And that's supposed to be just fine for the children. The Beatles sang, Minister, that all you need is, is love. But that was never meant to be a legislative proposal, Minister. There is a right to the love of each genetic parent, and it shouldn't be deliberately interfered with, except for exceptional cases where the child's own welfare dictates. Now, I've deliberately avoided, Minister, any significant reference to the proposed referendum to change the meaning of marriage. I've said in the public domain, and I repeat here, that the timing of this radical bill today is all about pretending that the change in the constitutional meaning of marriage has no implications for children's rights to the father and the mother. That is yet another way, Minister, in which children's rights are being subverted for other more political, adult-centred purposes in this legislation. And I'm on my last paragraph of Chahirlik Gzgurumahagat. This political cynicism, Minister, is, however, futile, because the issue of the referendum and this legislation do remain intricately connected. This bill will need to be radically amended to restore the primacy of children's rights and welfare. The Constitution, if it is changed in the way the government proposes, will block the Oireachtas from re restoring the prior right of children to fathers and mothers, where possible, their own fathers and mothers in every situation. This legislation, if it passes in this form, will be central to the referendum campaign, therefore. So let me ask you one minister, let me ask you one relevant question in conclusion. If the referendum fails, will the government, and this is the last line, will the, although it's a long line, will the government <coughs> accept that the reason is public concern about children's rights to fathers and mothers? If the referendum fails, will you accept that that's the reason? And will you then accept as government that the sections of this legislation which contemplate the deprivation of a child's right to a father and mother, which are fundamentally misconceived and unjust, will have to be changed? And will you in that event commit to revisiting this legislation in that event? Thank you, Senator.